So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second night of our mission. It's good to see so many people seem to have returned in this cold weather. So hopefully we'll have uh, some good reflections tonight as we continue our meditation on the mysteries of the life of St. Joseph. So why don't we go ahead and begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so yesterday, for the first night of our mission, we looked at the, the mystery of Joseph's participation in the Nativity, the role that he played, specifically looking at how things didn't go as planned, or maybe as we would have hoped or would have expected for the birth of the Messiah. There were plenty of challenges, and Joseph didn't allow himself to get disappointed, but continued to move forward and press on. He let go of any expectations he might have had in order to accept reality, and in doing so, be able to provide for Mary and for Jesus and to find inner peace and to find joy. Now we want to pass to another mystery. And again, these are not necessarily all going to be organized. We're skipping some, but as I said, this is sort of an addendum to a mission or retreat that I gave last year. Uh, and several people asked, I will make the, the URL available uh, to Father Brent so that you can go and listen to them uh, and sort of get a full picture of these reflections on St. Joseph, trying to, to remain pious and to remain devoted, but also to sort of look at him from a very human perspective. And so today we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, the part of Luke chapter 2 that talks about, it gives us the story of the presentation in the temple, which is one of the joyful mysteries. And so we want to sort of understand some of the details of the presentation of the temple. This happened 40 days after Jesus' birth. And it was part of the Jewish law that 40 days after the first male's birth, he was to be presented to the Lord of the temple. And this goes back to Exodus chapter 13, but also the woman was supposed to go because of Leviticus chapter 12 in order to be ritually purified, although we know that Mary would not have needed that, just as Christ wouldn't need it to have been baptized, but still obeyed the law anyway. And so they had to travel to Jerusalem, to the temple, to present Jesus and to make a sacrifice. So Luke chapter 2 talks about how they came with the sacrifice of uh, turtle doves or a pigeon. This is the sacrifice of a family who was poor, not something more intricate or more uh, expensive. When we get there, we don't really hear much about the purification ritual, or we don't hear anything about the actual presentation, but instead we see how Mary and Joseph encounter two different characters. The first is Simeon. Simeon, who is an older man there, who upon seeing Christ entered the temple, the Messiah entered the temple, he realizes what is going on and therefore praises God and rejoices to see the fulfillment of God's promises. And this is the sort of canticle that the church reads at night prayer before um, we call a finish to the day. But also, interestingly, he speaks sort of a prophecy but he speaks it specifically to Mary. And this is Luke chapter two, verses 34 to 35. Behold, this child, Jesus, is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. A mysterious phrase, we're not gonna exactly get into what it means, because we're focusing more on Joseph, then on Mary. But after Simon 
gives this prophecy. Then we see they encounter this old woman, Anna, who gives thanks to God and praises him for being able to see and encounter the Messiah enter the temple. But the question that I, I sort of want to pose today is, where does Joseph fit in all this? He's there, he hears everything, he's obviously present, he's an integral part of this. And what is Joseph's role? Well, primarily, Joseph's role, along with Mary, is to bring his son, to bring Jesus the firstborn in the temple, to present him and to offer him back to God, back to Yahweh. There's a very important lesson in this, and it's something that I spoke about to the parishioners at Wisdom for the solemnity of or the Feast of the Holy Family. That this presentation of the temple, of Joseph presenting Jesus to the Lord of the temple, shows us the lesson that children, all children, are gifts to us from God. The children, even though they may be begotten by us, ultimately are gifts to us from God. They're not objects like a home or a car or a phone that we can possess. They are gifts given to us, and just as we're stewards of creation, that we don't own creation, we are stewards of the lives, the children that are given to us. And so, at some point, we're going to have to let our children go. Whether it be growing up, letting them go to grow up, to get married, to follow their vocation, or ultimately to be able to give them back to God. And we're going to have to give them back with interest to be able to show how we love them, how we raise them in freedom, and how we form them. And sort of a great example of this in the Old Testament is Abraham's willingness to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. Not that any of us are going to sacrifice our children in that way. The willingness to be able to offer what has been given to us, even the thing that is most precious, our children and their lives, back to the Father who is the source of all good gifts. And so in order for a parent to be able to do this, in order for Joseph to be able to do this, he's got to be able to love his child, but as we'll see, to love him in a way that he doesn't hold on, that he doesn't grasp, that he doesn't cling on to the child. And Joseph does this and is able to do it in a very real way because he realizes that he's not the biological father of Jesus. He realizes that he is the foster father. So what do we call this love that Joseph expresses to Jesus and that we all should express to our own children and to a great degree, we should express to anyone that we meet? Well, there was a sort of a, a religious leader, a theologian in Italy in the 20th century who's up for beatification and canonization one day named Luigi Giussani. He's the founder of the Communion and Liberation Movement. And he calls this love possession in detachment. Possession in detachment. Now he talks about it for virgin or chaste love, but we could talk about it any love. That if we're going to love someone properly, particularly our children, yes, we possess them. We have them. But we must be detached. We can't hold on. We can't grasp. We've got to be willing to let them go. Many of you may remember 1995, this, the hit song by Sting. If you love somebody, set them free. You cannot hold them. You've got to be able to let them go. At least I saw one person smirk at that reference. She's sitting right there. She knows who she is. So I want to talk a little bit about Pope Francis because he talks about this and it was so beautiful in that letter that I mentioned last night that hopefully some of you may be went and read, Patris Corde, The Heart of the Father, talks about the love of Joseph for Jesus as this possession and detachment of not holding on to Jesus as an example of how we ought to love our own children. 
And I think it's earthly parents, but I would also say that it's spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers too, that priests and religious can learn a lot from this. And so it's a long quote, but it's a very beautiful one, and I'm gonna do like I did last night, my best to try to explain it and to sort of flesh it out. So Pope Francis says, being a father entails introducing children to life and reality. Sort of extending upon what we talked about last night, learning to accept reality as it is, to not have these false expectations or not to be idealistic. Not holding them back, being overprotective or possessive, but rather making them capable of deciding for themselves, enjoying freedom and exploring new possibilities. Perhaps for this reason, Joseph is traditionally called a most chaste father. That title is not simply a sign of affection, but the summation of an attitude that is the opposite of possessiveness. Chastity, and I'm gonna say it's for people who are celibate, but we're all called to be chaste of heart. We're all called to be chaste. Chastity is freedom from possessiveness in every sphere of one's life. Only when love is chaste is it truly love. A possessive love ultimately becomes dangerous. It imprisons, constricts, and makes for misery. God himself loved humanity with a chaste love. He left us free even to go astray and set ourselves against him. The logic of love is always a logic of freedom. And Joseph knew how to love with extraordinary freedom. Let me say that again. Joseph knew how to love with extraordinary freedom. He never made himself the center of things. He did not think of himself, but focused instead on the lives of Mary and Jesus. It's a beautiful quote. And again, much more beautifully and succinct than I can put it, he describes the love that Joseph had for Mary and Jesus and the chaste love that we ought to have for our children and the other people that the Lord has given us to love. And so the presentation in the temple and what it sort of signifies or what it means on a deeper spiritual level is one of the mysteries in the life of Jesus and Mary sort of exemplifies the attitude that Joseph has throughout his entire life. This possession in detachment, having, loving, being the steward of, but never grasping or clinging, never holding so close Jesus or Mary that he never gave them freedom, never restricting their ability to breathe or to live that he loves them chastely with extraordinary freedom. And what makes us be able to love in freedom is that when we are loving chastely, we're not pulled down by our passions, by the lusts and desires of the heart, by attachments of the flesh. The primarily, we love others as the Lord loves them we realize that they ultimately belong to God and not to us. And that our duty in loving other people, particularly our children and those who have been given to us, is to reflect the love of God the Father to them. That an earthly father's love is a profound reflection of the love of God the Father in the same way that a priest or a bishop's love is a reflection of God the Father's love. And so what that does, in loving with extraordinary freedom, opens up a space for the beloved to live, to breathe, to grow, to develop in freedom. And Joseph did this throughout his entire life. And by presenting his son, Jesus, at the temple and saying, hey, Jesus belongs to you. I am only his father, fa foster father. It set that attitude for the next 30 years, an attitude of always loving 
Jesus in freedom, loving Mary in freedom, and giving them the space to grow and to develop. He doesn't smother. He doesn't cling on to Jesus for his identity. He finds his identity in Christ, but he doesn't hold on in a way that's unhealthy. He loves in the way that we ought to with extraordinary freedom, giving us an example as physical parents, potentially as grandparents, but also as spiritual parents of how to love and teaching us a very important lesson. See, we got some parents in here. See, we've got some grandparents in here. Grandparents, you probably have already learned this lesson. Parents, maybe you need to learn this lesson, that your children do not belong to you. They are not your possession. We're called to love our children, to form our children in the faith and in the human virtues, but we've got to do so in freedom so that one day they'll leave and they'll be able to make their own choices, their own mistakes. Of course, that's the thing. Jo Joseph knew Jesus wasn't going to make a mistake, that he was God. It's a little different with our own children, but we've got to do our best to form them and to one day say, it's time to leave the nest. It's time to make your own family, to choose your own way in life. But the problem is, today, we have a lot of helicopter parents. You know what that is, those parents who hover around their children, who smother them, who put too many rules and too many regulations. Why? Probably because of, of good intentions, because they don't want them to be hurt. They want them to be successful. But what ends up happening, they put so many restrictions on their kids, often in the name of faith. By the time that kid turns 18, they're going to run the other way. And the parent's sitting around wondering, what did I do wrong? And whenever a father tells you what you did wrong, you get mad at father. That's how it works. We smother our children in the idea that we're going to do them good. But generally, it almost always leads to rebellion. Kids owe respect and obedience to their parents. It's one of the commandments. It's very, very important. And I tell kids all the time when they're younger, obey your parents, your life will be much easier. But there comes a point when that child is going to move out of the house. There comes a time when the child is going to have to make their own decisions and you're going to have to give the child the space and the freedom to do so, trusting that you did the best that you good, could. you got to let him go. And even if you know they are going to do bad things. I love to go back to the parable of the prodigal son. The father knew what that son was going to do with his money. He knew where he was going to go. He didn't think he was going to go buy some rosaries and go hang out with his friends given to the poor. He was going to do bad things. He knew it. And he pleaded with him, please don't do it. But the son said, no, you're dead to me. I'm going to do it. And guess what? The father let him go. The father let him go. It hurt his heart a lot. He was always there waiting for the kid to come back. But he had to go back in the house and live his life in hopes that that son would come back, in hopes that the good seed that the father had planted would come to fruition. The kid would one day wake up. But he doesn't chase after the kid. He doesn't hold him hostage. He lets him go even though he knows he's going to make bad decisions. Sometimes, as hard as it is, We've got to let the kids go and do that. But what I found is that these days, what's harder for parents to do is not to let their kids go to make horrible decisions, but to let their kids go to make really good decisions, like following God's call to be priest or religious. Very devout and seemingly holy parents start acting like petulant children throwing a conniption fit. Don't go, don't leave me. Wait a year, you're gonna deny me grandchildren. Oh, wait a second. The children's lives are not your life. They need to follow what God calls them to do. 
What happened to the days of when parents were excited that their children were gonna follow in that path of following Christ in a more radical way? What often happens is, and I'm not trying to condemn, although this does get my temper riled up, is the parents are clinging on their children because of their own insecurities and self-hatred. Let them go. Let your child go and pursue a vocation. It may not be for them, but they're never gonna know if you don't let them go. If your kids got married, guess what? Maybe they would move out too. They'd move to a different country and you'd have to learn to let them go. It's gonna be difficult, yes, but this is part and parcel of the natural process of things. It's hard for us here in central, uh, southern Louisiana because family is so important. It's hard to let our kids go and leave the nest. But please, parents, we pray for vocations. If your child says, I think I'm called to be a priest or religious, your response should be, yes, I'm so excited. Because when you don't act that way, you end up causing a lot of pain and a lot of conflict in the heart of your children. And so Pope Francis, again, sort of playing off of that same theme that we've been talking about of, of loving a child in freedom. He says, quote, when fathers, and I guess you would say mothers too, refuse to live the lives of their children for them. When fathers refuse to live the lives of their children for them, new and unexpected vistas open up. Every child is the bearer of a unique mystery that can only be brought to light with the help of a father who respects that child's freedom. A mother who respects that child's freedom. A father who realizes that he is most a father and an educator at the point when he becomes, quote unquote, useless. When he sees that his child has become independent and can walk the paths of life unaccompanied, when he becomes like Joseph, who always knew that his child was not his own, but had merely been entrusted to his care. In the end, this is what Jesus would have us understand when he says, call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. We've got to be able to believe that we're following the Lord's will and loving our children the best we can, or we're gonna love our kids like St. Joseph? Probably not. Probably not, but we're gonna do the best that we can and we're gonna say, it's time for you to go make your own decisions, to let our children become the men and women they are called to and exercising their freedom. This is what Joseph teaches us in presenting Jesus in the temple. And we're gonna see how he did it a little bit tomorrow when we look at the hidden life Nazareth. Now, when Pope Francis says that a father must become useless, are we trying to say that St. Joseph was useless, that Mary only mattered? Not at all. Are we trying to say that fathers are useless? Not at all. But I wonder though, and again, I don't know if this is the case, if maybe St. Joseph in this moment maybe sort of felt like what part am I really playing in this? How important am I to this whole mystery? Because it's the shepherds and the wise men who show up and bring all these gifts and without him really knowing it's gonna happen. I said yesterday, what are these guys doing over here? Well, what's going on? What does this, all this mean? Simeon, he walks in and seems to know so much about his child, Anna knows so much. How do they know this? Why wasn't I informed that they were gonna know about this, that this was gonna happen? And then Simeon speaks the prophecy to Mary, not to Joseph. Again, Joseph would have known, okay, Mary's kind of special. She's, you know, he probably would have noticed by this time that she wasn't sinning, all right? And eventually to realize Joseph, Jesus is the son of God. Well, what part am I gonna play in all this? Maybe he felt a little insecure. He was tempted possibly by the evil one to feel like he was just an observer. 
Like he didn't really belong in the family. He didn't belong in the part of this whole drama, even though obviously the angels had spoken to him and he had a real part to play. And, you know, I think it's something that sometimes fathers can feel like, men can feel like in our culture today, because quite often their masculinity is put down, their fatherhood is pushed off to the side. And sometimes men do it to themselves, by stepping back and saying, I'm going to let the woman take care of this. But even if the father or the man really wants to be involved, sometimes his effort really goes unnoticed. And I can even tell you a story about this as a priest. And again, it's somewhat relevant to this, probably maybe more relevant than I think. So as a priest, I do a fair amount of work giving retreats and youth conferences, particularly in workshops because I work with college students. And, and I've realized that young people, and maybe old people, if you see a priest wearing a collar, dressed like I am, will come up and maybe ask some advice. But if a religious priest, like a Dominican, or Father Champagne, who wears his little costume, we're gonna take some shots of Father Champagne today, look at that. They completely ignore the diocesan priest. Who is that? They want to talk to the person in the fancy costume. And so they're talking to the Dominicans and talking to Father Champagne, or Father Champagne's talking to them, as it may be. But let me tell you right now, a religious sister in a habit comes around, we don't exist at all. They are going to talk to those religious sisters. So I was telling this story to some sisters that I knew uh, a few years ago, and they were saying, Father, you're so wrong. They people love the priesthood. No, they don't. They love you, sister, because you're sweet and you're nice. No, that's simply not true. So I just so happened to be riding to the airport with them. And I said, watch, sister. I'm going to prove it to you, or the Lord's going to prove it to you in this airport. We're going to get, so we got down. It's me and two sisters and the beautiful flowing habits. Within a minute of us walking to the airport, these two women ran up and said, sisters, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen sisters in such a long time. And going on and on and on, I might as well have been invisible. I mean, really might as well have been invisible. I was laughing to myself. And then finally, after them yapping to the sisters for two or three minutes, oh, hey, Father, I didn't see you there. Well, of course. And the sister said, when the ladies left, oh, it was just a coincidence. I said, no, it's not, sister. So we're gone. And another minute, minute after we get our tickets, a lady who's walking to the airport because she's doing some, some cleaning, oh, sisters, I want you to pray for my children. And I just kept walking. They didn't even notice me. And so I said, sisters, I was right. And they said, well, I guess you kind of are. It's true. People love to see the female, the feminine uh, example of dedication to the Lord. So I'm pretty sure everywhere that Jesus went with Mary, nobody wanted to talk to Joseph. Oh, look at the cute baby. Oh, Mary, you're so sweet. And Joseph was just sitting around there thinking about the next thing he was going to build. And so... He still was around, though. He still took the duty of bringing Jesus to the temple. He still took an active part in the formation of his son. But he was often probably unnoticed. Oh, who's Jesus? He's just the carpenter's son. And probably Joseph just faded off in the background as often that he did. He probably actually sat around with his father-in-law, St. Joachim who nobody cares about. St. Anne, oh, we're gonna to pray to St. Anne. Look at that, we got a statue of St. Anne back there. Where's St. Joachim? He and Joseph probably sat around drinking some coffee, saying they pay attention to the ladies, they never pay attention to us, but that's how it works. But it's something that I think that we need to reflect on in our own culture and society to pay more attention to the role of the father how important fathers are, and how the work they often go, do goes unnoticed. And, and so as I was sort of preparing for this, I stumbled upon an old poem that some of you may remember, that you may be read when you were in high school or college. It's by a poet named Robert Hayden, and it's from the 60s, and it's called Those Winter Sundays. And it's one of my favorite poems. I'll read it. 
I don't know how good I am at reading poems, but I think it gets the message through that I'm trying to convey that I'm going to develop a little bit. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor and the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? How beautiful that is. A child growing older and realizing, here he is, a dad out taking care of the food, the farm, and while he's in bed and he can hear the cold and make that house creak, he's there putting the fire, warming up the house, fixing his shoes, getting his clothes ready, and no one ever thanked him. No one ever thanked him. But the dad never asked to be thanked. Joseph never asked to be thanked. Granted, Mary and Jesus thanked Joseph a lot. That's why we'll see tomorrow, Joseph was a very, very happy man. People were like, Joseph, why are you in such a good mood? We're going to find out why Joseph is in such a good mood uh, tomorrow. But the father is in the background. But like a good father, he's not there to draw attention to himself. The silent Saint Joseph, willing to be useless, willing to fade off in the background without drawing attention to himself, pointing attention to his son Jesus. But the truth is, as I said, even though we may not recognize them, we may not thank our dads as much as we ought to, fathers are very, very important. And I think one of the reasons that our bishop dedicated this year to St. Joseph, and one of the reasons the Holy Father did too, besides him being uh, the patron of the church, besides him teaching us to accept reality, is because we, particularly in the West, we have lost our understanding and the importance of fathers. Fathers have their own unique gifts to bring. They raise their children and they offer it in a very unique way, whether it be a physical father or whether it be a spiritual father. We need the man, we need the father in the world in a unique way to introduce them to life and to reality. Now, does this mean that if you don't have a father, that you're going to end up being a weirdo? Not at all. There are plenty of father figures that we can adapt. Even St. Joseph can be a foster father to all of us. Uh, but the thing is that we don't recognize often the role the father plays. I was listening to a TED talk of this female attorney who does work with divorces and often really primarily works with fathers who are trying to get custody of their children. And as you may know, in divorce cases, the father loses every single time. The father really has very, very any serious recourse to getting the children. And so what happens is, is quite often the mother, rightly or wrongly, accuses the father of not being present, of being a deadbeat dad. And believe me, there are some deadbeat dads out there. The dad's not present. He doesn't pick up the kids. He's not there to take care of them. But when they talk to the father, or they even talk to the children, that's a different story. Oh yeah, dad's there when he lifts me up in the air. When the dad's there when I fall off my bike. Dad's there when I hurt myself. And the father is there in a certain sense to catch the child, but to introduce the child into reality in a way that a mother normally doesn't. To teach the kid to take risks. To get on that bike and maybe you're gonna fall to do something, not necessarily dangerous, but the mother wouldn't want to do. I remember one time I was in the background, I'd just done a baptism, and all the women were inside, and the dads were outside, sitting around, drinking beer, whatever the dads were doing. The kids were kicking the, the, the soccer ball around. And I remember watching this. This soccer ball, as one boy kicked in that soccer ball, sped through and nailed this little girl, maybe five or six, straight in the face. I mean, you heard the pop. The little girl it was that stance before she was going to cry or not to cry, and she walks up to the dad and she's like this, and the dad said, it's going to be okay. 
You're gonna be fine. There's no blood, there's no broken nose. Just don't go in the house and tell your mom. Because we know what happened. It would be the end of the party. Because dad's like, okay, you're gonna be okay. Gave her a kiss in the nose and the girl went back and played. And granted, if there was some sort of a compound fracture, the dad would have done something. But I just can imagine all the men were sitting around afterwards, I was there. If the mom would have seen that, oh my goodness. And so the dad has his own unique gift. He's not being negligent. He's teaching the child to face and accept reality. And we do have a crisis of fatherhood with fathers who are not doing that, who are caught up in their own lives and their own passions and their own addictions, whatever they may be. But we need those dads. And so I thank the dads that are here and the dads and the grandfathers and the priests and the uncles and the godfathers who step in the place of fathers who are absent. Let's see it. I work with college students and I've seen it get worse over the course of 10 years. Young men who have not had fathers and are addicted to all sorts of things who don't want to take risks and who fear commitment in a very, very significant way. But not just for the boys, for the girls too. Not having a dad there to say, you're beautiful, I love you. And so a lot of the times the young women grew up insecure, filled with shame because they had a mom who might have been overbearing and a dad who simply wasn't present or didn't recognize or notice her. Imagine, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, the imprint, the love of Joseph as a father left on Jesus' humanity. Left on Jesus' humanity. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But here's the thing, as I kind of bring this to a conclusion, the most important thing, it's like I said, all the other stuff, I'm sort of preaching to the choir, we know about that. The most important thing that I want to reflect on tonight and it's Luke chapter 2, still from the presentation, but it's an offline that we might not even notice. Verse 33, that after Simeon says all of these things before he gives the prophecy to Mary, Luke says that both the mother and the father marveled at what Simeon said. Marveled. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have a little program on my computer that can do some Greek research. And actually, it's the same word used a few verses before in Luke chapter 2, verse 18, when it says that all present there in the nativity wondered at the things that the shepherds told them the angel said. Even though it's translated one time as marveled, the other time as wondered, it's the same Greek word. Thaumatso, which means to wonder or to be amazed at a miracle or some work or deed of God. And so what we do is we see Joseph and Mary and others, but specifically here Joseph, presented with this miracle, presented with the power and the majesty of the incarnation. Does he understand it all? No. Does he understand how God's plan is going to play out. No, he doesn't, but he still is amazed. He still wonders at what's happening. And so we too are called to be like Joseph, to be individuals who when we see the Lord work in our lives, when we see his majesty in creation, to be people of wonder and amazement. And so, St. Joseph is a man of wonder, a man of amazement. Like Joseph in the Old Testament, his namesake, Genesis chapter 37, verse 19, when they call Joseph the master dreamer. He's the dreamer. He's the wonderer. And to wonder over something means to, to ponder deeply to keep things in our heart, to contemplate them, to let it soak, the amazement soak in. Imagine that you see a beautiful sunset or you see what you perceive to be something amazing and, and something miraculous. 
And your jaw drops, your eyes open really big. You wonder at this thing above you. And it doesn't just accept it, but it reflects on it in the mind, but more deeply in the heart. Being able to perceive through this wonderful, amazing thing, God working through, showing his power, showing his beauty, showing his very existence. We don't fully understand it. Something which is so amazing and wonderful sort of goes beyond our comprehension. We can't fully grasp it, but we're willing to embrace that which we don't understand, to embrace the mystery that is presented to us. When we think of wonder, we think of amazement, who, what demographic should we really think of the most? Children. Children are the best at wondering at creation. Why? Because as they grow older, everything is new. They wonder at the flower. They wonder at the stream. They wonder at colors in front of them. But what happens is, as we get older, we just sort of take things for granted. We understand how things work, and we lose that sense of wonder, that sense of asking questions. Well, why is it the way it is? Why does this have to be? How does this work? This inquisitiveness, this childlike philosophical approach to the reality. This is what St. Joseph had. And encountering these mysteries, encountering these things he didn't fully understand, encountering the ways that God worked in his life, he was a man of wonder. He never took it for granted. But it's so easy for us, particularly in the world today, to get distracted with our phones or a screen or, or the latest television show we're watching on Netflix. Or we get so used to science and technology explaining everything away. Or we go through our life numb, just living on the surface, never thinking deeply, never wanting to feel anything because we don't want to deal with the pain that we are experiencing and the depths of our heart. So Joseph being person of wonder, of being amazed at the way that God works and speaks to him, we are called to be the same way, to be like Joseph, but to be like children, because children are the ones that wonder, to be childlike in our faith, to wonder at the gift of creation, to wonder at God's work, because it is only children that are able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Children who see how God works in their lives and in the things around them. Children also who do not grasp, but love. Children who accept reality as it comes to them and do not have expectations or preconditions on the ways they think things should work. Children who can live and love in peace, joy, and freedom. And so Joseph, the core of his heart, is childlike in his way that he lives and the way that he loves. This idea of Joseph as childlike is actually part of another talk from that original series that I gave last year. So in conclusion, I want to give you some homework, some things to meditate upon just as I did yesterday. And as I like to do, there are three things. Three things are easy for you to remember. We want to go to Father Brent later and see if he can remember the three things from yesterday. Quiz him on it. He's in the back there. First of all, what is the attitude we have towards our children or to our grandchildren? Whatever it is, do we see them as gifts or do we see them as possessions? Are we smothering them? Or we're afraid of letting them go because then we're going to be alone and without someone to listen to us. Do we govern them? Do we form them out of fear instead of love? That's the first question. Are we possession and detachment or possession and fear and clinging? Fathers and mothers, are you living out your vocation? Fathers, living out your role in forming children in their freedom. Mothers, and doing the same thing, whether a father is present or not, and fathers whether a mother is present or not. We have some wonderful, powerful, single parents who are raising their kids. 
It just takes one sane parent to raise a kid. That's, well, that's what I had a psychologist friend of mine say. What are we doing? Are we teaching that child to grow in freedom, to be able to embrace reality? And finally, are we like St. Joseph? Do we have that childlike attitude of being able to see God work in creation, see him work around us, and to be able to wonder, to be able to still be amazed at how much he loves us and how much he provides for us? I know that's a lot, but hey, finish in 45 minutes, did a good job. Tomorrow, God willing, we will be back. Hopefully you'll come back. Um, and we're going to look at probably the biggest mystery of Joseph's life is the 30 years of hidden life at Nazareth, where all we really know is that Jesus was obedient to Joseph and to Mary. And so we're going to spend some time exploring that, trying to understand what Joseph's role might have been in that and how it can help us grow in our own spiritual life during this year of St. Joseph. So. We did last night, let's close with a glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.